Here we go. All right. So I want to just welcome Ellen Hackelfagan to our group, and she's going to talk a little bit about herself as an artist and also her gallery, Odetta Gallery. And you've got other things that you're involved in as well, which I don't have off the top of my head because I forgot all my stuff as I was moving around. But um, but the Shim Shim Network is that correct, Ellen? So I'm going to let you hand it over to you and you can. Share well, and I just want to say thanks for inviting me. Um, it's always good practice to speak publicly. Uh, so I, I appreciate the practice. And uh, my next solo artist is in the room with us, Suzanne Benton. Oh, so Suzanne will be a featured artist for three month. And we're opening an exhibition in Odetta Petite. And that will open on March 8th, International Women's Day. So oh. I was thrilled to realize that Suzanne was a part of your group and even more thrilled to see her here today. I so missed it. <laughs> so um, it's nice to meet your group, number one. Um, thank you so much. There's some familiar faces and some that I've never met, um, but it's uh, just a real pleasure to continue to meet artists. So, um, Feel free to ask questions and um, I'm going to start sharing the screen and hope that I do this fairly well. Um, you got to see where that image is. I guess I have to pull it up. There we go. Um, can you guys see this? Yes. Yes. Um, I'm Ellen Hackelfagan. Some of you may know my work over the years. I build connections between color and sound in my work. And um, I've been a painter as long as you guys have. I mean, I, I, I was one of the founding members of the Women's Caucus for Art in Connecticut when we reopened the chapter in uh, 1990. I um, helped get the first database and mailing lists online and I was the exhibition coordinator for that group. And our first real membership drive was uh, centered around a members exhibition in Meriden where my studio was located back in 1990, and then we got to host a traveling exhibition there, Birth Art, Miracle and Mystery. And that was uh, one of my first extending myself as a potential curator artist uh, into the world. Um, so uh, my work, Ecstatic Paint, uh, was the result of my um, graduate studies at Hartford Art School, which I pursued this, um, this degree in my 40s. I decided that I wasn't happy with where my career was and the only stone left to turn over and look under was more education. And uh, I got so much out of being an MFA student in my 40s all of those years of painting independently, um, I was cooking up my own theories. And it turned out that in those 20 some odd years of painting independently, there were a lot of people writing about the same concerns. So it was really a validation that even though I felt separate in my studio, I was conscious of you know, what painting and contemporary painting was about and the underpinnings philosophically. So out of that, in my thesis, it became ecstatic paint. I think you guys all know this about graduate studies in many cases. By the time you get into your second year, I was there full time, um, you really start to wipe the slate clean and dive in full into where you think you're supposed to be listening and going. So ecstatic paint was almost a calendar of sorts where I wanted to do a panel every day. 
and just let the materials do the talking. It wasn't going to be me as the author. It was going to be the paint as the author. And that was um, very freeing. Oh, sorry, I don't quite know how to work this uh, image to image. Um, so each of the pieces was working with gravity and evaporation and not so much about authorship. And I found, was relieved to find the paint has no limits. I still am working out what is the tensile strength of paint? What is the evaporation rate of paint? Where is paint going to fail me? And in fact, it just, it's limitless. It's one of those areas in our lives where if you're fortunate enough to dig in, there's no limit. And it keeps speaking to me over and over. So this voice, this speaking is very authentic with me. Um, I don't know if I'm a classic synesthete, synesthesia, but I do know that I am listening constantly and I work in an embodied art. So the art is coming through a matrix, not unlike how a chef works or how a dancer works. Our information comes in through our body and out through our bodies, our hands and whatnot. And um, so ecstatic paint for me was akin to ecstatic dance that you might be moved into a trance-like state through repetition and action. And um, that this hypersensate kind of language starts to become known to you and you try to express it. I'm very closely connected to dance in my work. I've danced all my life, except for recently. And um, do you have a question, Suzanne? No, I just wrote brilliant. I just think you speak so magnificently and it's fascinating. <laughs> Sorry. I, I don't know. I don't know if you can um, share the chat with me later also, um, Janine, but that'd be great. And any questions, maybe Janine, you, you, if you've got power, you might conduct any questions uh, so that we keep the conversation rolling. Um, so uh, with dance, uh, that is how I paint. I actually paint off of the floor or off of the table so that again, I'm listening with my viscera, I'm listening with my center body. And um, often from the toes through the tips of the fingers is where the expression lies if it's large scale work. Some of you may have seen my video when I was getting ready for a solo show this summer. Um, up in Torrington at five points. And if you haven't seen it, you're welcome to, I'll, I'll hand you that link or it's on my links here on my website. But um, ecstatic paint moved on and I wanted to really talk about how pattern had a voicing and how surface had a voicing. So color sound pattern, these are paintings that are residual sort of studies that run on the side of specifically focused um, series. And this piece in particular, wood grains with vocals, the paintings are eight by 10 inch uh, clayboard panels and wood grains for me are like vocal cords vibrating or a guitar string or a cello string being pulled and that resonating vibration. So a wood grain is a direct depiction of sound for me. And in this piece, I asked people when it was exhibited to sing out these different panels. I wanted to know, is there a difference when there's a pattern with a color versus a solid? When you get into something like this, what happens? How do you express it? So this idea that I want the audience to tell me about what these paintings sound like is also a big part of who I am as a, a creative artist. 
Color Sound Grammar is a series where I had a number of open studios and I was scared to death that people would come through and have nothing to say because the work was abstract. And I was a part of the citywide open studios alternative spaces where you might have 400 studios in a building in New Haven and these viewers are coming through and if they give you more than a second with abstraction, it's a miracle. So I thought, no way, this is my chance. And I created a game and it's the color sound grammar game where I asked people to take colors, pair them to notes in the do, re, mi scale or pair them to notes in the primary melody of the ABC song, which is also Twinkle Twinkle Little Star. I wanted primary melodies that anyone from any country was probably familiar with this melody and could play the game. And then I paired the colored squares. Uh, they would pair the colored squares with the sounds. This one here is tied to the ABC song melody. So the lower register ABCD, every single, let's see if I can bring this in more. Um, I can't bring it up any larger here, I'm sorry. Um, but every line that has white dots running through it is one of the tones in that melody, one of the notes that the viewer would have picked. And um, this one was mine. This was related to the Do, Re, Mi, starting in the lower register of the C major scale and then moving up into the higher register. And in this painting, I was developing what is the shape and the form of that sound as I'm singing it out? What does it look like as a shape? and a color. So you can imagine the level of focus trying to get that work expressed and, um, and, and then uh, to show it. So that piece was alpha. This was the color sound grammar games, color sound choices with the Art Society of Old Greenwich inviting me to uh, have a presentation. So I took again their ABC song melody sounds and created paintings from this data. Very interested in language. These accordion folded paperworks were do, re, mi scales that musicians paired colors to the notes in the do, re, mi scale. So eight sides for the eight notes in a single octave. From that data gathered, I also, I collect textiles and I'm very interested in indigenous textiles and the iconography in them and how that language was built over time and why these motifs are universal over time. And there was a, a rug that was at my friend Mona Berman's house just a fragment of a rug and it just, it was music, it was math, it was amazing. And it sort of had this design to it, sort of a, a riff on a flower, if you will. And the way that it had both duality with figure ground was really of interest to me. So this was the colors chosen in this painting, Molecules of Music, was from color sound grammar games with the Do, Re, Mi scale over a, a, the 2012 year, the average dominant color selected by visitors to my studio, uh, open studio events, with then this design superimposed in a ghost-like manner I considered it a, a screen, like a cloister screen. And some of the circles have some pigment in them, more opaque in some, and others are transparent. This idea was how sound moves through air and where it might be stopped and where it might pass through.
I was taking the data from these color sound grammar games and generating a lot of paintings from them and using objects on a surface or paper. Uh, and like an abacus, these were the visitors to that open studio event where I was gathering data. This was the third year into doing this practice in New Haven Open Studios. This was one group with the color sound grammar games. Then it resulted in the total, um, and I'm sorry, I can't bring this up larger here. Um, this uh, was the total data of the do re mi scale ascending and then descending. And this side was the men that visited and gave me data on the open studio event through the course of a weekend in New Haven and the women. Mm -hmm. And um, this is a large painting. It's got many, many layers. And uh, what I was always so happy with was how this data just generated a portrait about this topic that I was interested in, which is language and a blended language between color and sound. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Ultimately, I narrowed it down and moved into Seeking the Sound of Cobalt Blue in 2014. I got a hold of this amazing product through KT Color, and it's a very matte pigment, very matte surface. And so you can see every little molecule, you can see every edge if you look closely, which resonates as sound. And this current work is the result of gathering household items and laying them down on large sheets of museum board. These objects, whoop. Hmm. don't know what's coming through and what isn't here. And, um, and then letting the materials evaporate and dry and let gravity do its job underneath my what I would call a stamping mechanism, but it's an industrial material, just ubiquitous to the studio. I wanted these to be a full toe to fingertip, full body experience, this large scale. These are nine feet by five feet and they, um, they're meant to be immersive. And uh, at the end of 2019 in New Haven, I went to the Ely Center at their uh, invitation was a part of their solos. And I got to create an installation working with window transparencies and LED lights in addition to the paintings to create an immersive experience. So this was called Immer Immersed in Blue. This little painting here, Seeking the Sound of Cobalt Blue Daisy Wheels, uh, I was commissioned by Ground Floor Gallery in Brooklyn to work with the Prevent Child Abuse America campaign last March. And their identifying brand color was blue and their identifying motif was pinwheels. So I was doing work for this commission. This piece here, daisy wheels come from the daisy wheel printers of yore. And so <laughs> again, there's a whole alphabet on the ends of all of these little printer wheels. So it's so close to my heart in terms of language. In terms of just everyday materials, I love paper towel. Uh, this is a series called Seeking the Sound of Cobalt Blue Bliss. Domestic Bliss is another series you'll see in my portfolio from going back in time. And I just regenerate print after print until the pigment's all gone. Uh, and uh, I've gotten a lot of pleasure out of that. 
This is utilizing netting from fruit bags or onion bags. This is a current piece using netting and starting to move from blue into other pigments. Um, so now I'm going to, this is the hard thing. Let me just try something here. Does anybody have any questions about Ellen's work thus far? <coughs> Good, I must be, I must be communicating well. <laughs> All right, on to Odetta Gallery. Um, <coughs> if you haven't been to Odetta Gallery, um, this was a long held dream of mine. I had been doing independent curation uh, in bits and pieces. And when my youngest son went off to college, I just was ready to roll now. You know, there was no reason to be home for dinner and no reason to be home for soccer or any other kid related thing. I got to do it all for me for the first time in, you know, what, I, three sons and in at least 27 years, you know, the, the first time for me and I ran and opened a gallery and I opened it just in time for Bushwick Open Studios in 2014. And I decided to invite four artists. You had to have artists from Bushwick. And I invited four artists that had never shown in Bushwick Open Studios because they were all curators or notable artists. And they, they were like, I've never been asked and I've been dying to be asked. So opening day, was uh, my first exposure to the Bushwick art scene. I mean, I went in as a total virgin. I just did what I've been longing to do and nobody knew me. 500 people were at that opening because of those artists. It was crazy. And these were my Harlem artist buddies, my studio mate, Alice Mom, my uh, friend, Norma, Marquez Orozco, who ran Floor for Art, where our studio was. Um, just, I can't describe for you what happened, but, but it was alarming at, at, at the very least that people, I had been so used to being completely under anybody's radar. I was a mother of three sons. Who cares what I make? I'm white, upper middle class. Who cares? Nobody unnotable, unrecognizable. Well, Odetta changed that significantly. And I had no expectation for that. I was really just following my heart. And um, the exhibition, uh, this was Enrico Gomez. He ran a parallel art space. This work here was Rob de Aude, who uh, also co-curated Parallel and then went on to um, start Transmitter. And uh, Marcus Linenbrink, you guys might know his work from the Aldrich Museum. And after that opening, all of a sudden I was asked to do studio visits and I didn't know how to set boundaries. I literally did 200 studio visits that first year. And I realized, okay, not sustainable, not sustainable. Um, but what shocked me, it really shocked me because I'm a mom, is how much trust artists were putting in me, not knowing me from Adam. They were willing to trust me with everything. And I just thought that can't be right. You know, you, you, need, to, you need to acknowledge yourself, you know, and I was guilty of this too. So, but it, it was alarming how much trust people were willing to just throw at me with their careers. And I felt, I felt that that was ill advised um, for any artist. They really need 
to understand that they're the master creator of their work, period. That's it. Everything else comes from there. Um, but I, I really have, here's Joe Amrine's work. He started Pierogi and the Flat Files back in 2000 and earlier. So you guys may know Joe, text-based work. So um, opening day, the title was based on something that is near and dear to my heart. And that is the works of James Joyce. And the fact that he speaks on so many different levels and with so many different voices, uh, he's a source of inspiration for me. And someday when I get a little more time, I'm gonna do a, a, a written essay on how I believe that he was synesthetic. Um, so uh, Odetta, I've, I started in Bushwick and in most of my exhibitions there, I really wanted to show the work of other curators and to give back to that community. Odetta as a space for viewing art, I did the build out and the design. So this is Mary Judge, you, some of you might know Mary, uh, Schema Projects. Mary did a whole new body of work for this show. And that's been a constant for me. Very often I get a whole new body of work from an artist and boy, if you've shown with me, thank you very much. <laughs> I really, again, I, I appreciate the trust you put in me and I do want to um, take care of your work. Victory Over the Sun was uh, the second Bushwick Open Studios exhibition. And the title is based on a play that was done in the early part of the 20th century and Malevich did the set design. And so the title of the play was Victory Over the Sun, but I invited Mary Judge and Gilbert Zhao to show uh, because I wanted to talk about the um, longstanding interest in the circle in the square and how that motif has just moved throughout history and culture. And um, so Malevich was a nice um, entry point for that when it came to um, abstraction. Um, I'm just gonna give you one more. Oh, here's, here's a good one too. Scribing the Void, uh, this artist, Kurt Steger, ended up um, transferring almost like a photograph with scribed cardboard templates, the surface of a boulder in Central Park, a very notable boulder called Empire Rock. Some of you might know it. It's just past John Lennon's Imagine. Um, it's that side, the west side of the park. And so scribing the void, he has uh, a lot of skills. This is sawdust from when he was cutting the, um, the, the panels uh, translated from the chipboard. This was an earlier study that we did, uh, or no, this one's a study on Empire Rock, sorry. We did a, a preamble. So scribing the void, um, this was hung at Odetta at the exact height of the boulder. So we were having a connection with a rock in Central Park that if you stood on the boulder, you would be on top of this void that we created in Odetta. This idea really took off for Kurt. And we, there's my old dog Odetta. She's no longer with us. Um, we um, were commissioned by coach to do this piece in their flagship store on Fifth Avenue. They wanted something that was iconic New York. We also did a reading of The Tempest <clears throat> in this space. I do a lot of interdisciplinary work. Um, and the exhibition uh, traveled to uh, Real Artways 
And of all crazy things, I don't know if I have an image of, uh, hold on. Here's good old Odie. Um, let's see if I have something further down. These, these chipboard templates were a way of reproducing the piece. So when coach called me, the designer called me and said, we really want to see this piece. How can we see it? I said, well, we just deinstalled and the work is traveling. Right now it's on a truck and it's going to Hartford. It will be opened again in about two weeks and will be on view till the end of February. And they said, well, we need to buy it in early November. How are we gonna do that? And I said, I'll get back to you. And I went to Kurt and I said, are you willing to reproduce this given your templates? And he said, yeah, I actually wanted to make it stronger. So we had a commission and we had Real Art Ways. And in Real Art Ways, I don't think I have an image of this. Um, I, I partnered with a composer, RSM, and uh, we took the chipboard templates and lined them up along the full length of the wall at Odetta. There's a long wall opposing this, this wall here, the opposite side. It was 87 feet of a line, a curved line. And RSM used that and superimposed musical staff over it and the rocks surface composed the music. And then at Real Artways, Hartford Symphony performed it live. So RSM had to transcribe for the first time in his life as a young composer for symphony. That was one of the toughest things he'd been asked to do. And he came back from Europe to see the performance and um, this was just a, this was such a win-win. I sold the piece, uh, you know, which we thought was totally impossible. Um, sold it on first dibs, you know, from a thumbnail image. I mean, just some, some things where if you, if you present the work in such a way that it, it starts to really connect people to an expanded thought on the object. Um, oftentimes you find there's business to be made there and enjoyed. Um, and I'm learning how to do that uh, better and better. And I, I really love running the gallery because as an artist, it teaches me how to run my business um, as an artist. Um, one last exhibition. Well, there's so many, please go through. The, this is my um, archives on Odetta Gallery's page under recent. If you go to recent exhibitions, you'll see these. I had to move the gallery uh, at the end of May, 2019. Every summer at Odetta Bushwick, I gave a sculptor the full space because sculpture in New York City is impossible to come by. The rule of thumb was that it had to be monumental. Therefore, you were not allowed to walk it through the door. It had to be built on site or pieced together on site. So artists had sort of a residency period for 10 days while they made it all happen. Um, and then we ran the exhibition so I'm a fan of sculpture because again, like the rest of what we do, it embraces the impossible, the imagination, what we think and dream about, it embraces. This was my last really formal exhibition in Odetta of minimalism. It was, it was a two-parter called Las Gravitas. This one, the first one was political work and the second one was more about just gravity and how gravity works in art. And then my very last show 
at Odetta Bushwick was with Ann Chernow. And that exhibition was called uh, Femme Fatale. Oh, Ellen, just so you know, Ann is one of our members as well. And she wanted to be here, but she had a conflict. Yeah, that's a busy woman. And um, Ann and Suzanne are two artists that I consider my mentors. Um, and uh, so I was, again, honored to bring Ann to Odetta during Women's International Women's Month and the final show in Bushwick. I had to leave the Bushwick space after a five year residency there or, or tenancy there. This is Susan B. Some of you guys might know her from AIR. So she had the flat files in the back and you see some of my work, that's my studio. It doubled as my studio. Um, but uh, here I was running shows concurrently also in uh, Chelsea in a space that I was um, coming into uh, on first dibs. They were creating a flagship store which was the polar opposite visually to Odetta Bushwick. Odetta Bushwick was full of light and I used light a lot in exhibitions because it moved through the space like a sundial. But this was all enclosed and these really sensual charcoal gray walls. It looked like heavy chocolate melted. You know, I loved handling that color with art. Um, and Gila's interests also revolved around film noir. And uh, so we, uh, we got to show Gila in, um, in Odetta, Chelsea at the same time as Odetta Bushwick. And for the last several years, I've been running more than one gallery at once. It's been a lot of work. Um, there's, just a, there's just a lot left to do. Um, a lot of, a lot of uh, what do I wanna say? I guess I love working with artists and I love telling stories and I love learning from my artists. And um, I think at the end of the day, the reason why I love curating is because I'm one of eight children. I'm number six. And there were always conversations swimming around me at the dinner table. It was never about me, ever, ever, ever. You know, it was always about you um, or you or you or you. <laughs> so, so I think that's why I like to crowdsource gather data and tell stories. Right now, I think you can see on the screen share, these are the galleries that I'm running. And I just closed Deborah Perlman, A Kind of Language. We were a guest at Project Art Space. All socially distanced. Not sure if I'm gonna get any images of this here right now. Deborah, now that I've moved into a digital realm, it's a little easier to show photography. I find when I'm composing exhibitions on gallery walls, photography is a tough one because it's a different surface than when the hand applies material to a surface for art. And it's just hard to integrate it because it's often really smooth. And so um, having an opportunity to show photography digitally or in smaller spaces as a guest um, has been a nice addition to what I can look at and share. Um, so we just closed Deborah Perlman, A Kind of Language. This will show a few more images, I think. Yeah, here. 
Her interest in street photography is something that she tends to then take the source photographs and creates paintings and mixed media works and a lot of sculpture from. However, these are the source of those ideas. And I was fortunate in that she was willing to print them up monumentally scaled for this exhibition. And um, they're full of humor. They're full of art history, uh, just a joy. Concurrently, we started Odetta Digital at the beginning of June last year. The Shim Art Network, it's my friend, Peter Hopkins. Peter and I were both gallerists in Bushwick. And uh, so he has been working on alternative <coughs> gallery models and developed Shim as a way to bring artist groups into various <laughs> spaces without having to rent or be the owner of any one space. So he showed a few of his groups at Odetta Bushwick after I closed my program. I extended the lease and gave him an opportunity there. <clears throat> and we also showed some video work. And uh, so he and his gallery manager approached me in March or April and said, we think that you'd be great in sales um, to create Odetta Digital and to work on the digital side of the Shim Art Network since none of us can meet in real life. And this was back during lockdown. So um, Suzanne and Ann Chernow are both members of Odetta Digital now. And um, it's, it's a platform that puts an artist's work onto Artsy. And uh, you, you can come in under a variety of groups with Shim. You are not forced to be a member of Odetta Digital by any stretch of the imagination. However, that's one access point. And our current exhibition is the third in this first year. We update our exhibitions quarterly. The artists submit images to me. And I'll just show you what that looks like right now. I'm in the fourth quarter, about to open an exhibition called Page Turner. So the artists that have reached out to me, I have their work on my desktop and it'll end up being featured on Artsy come, uh, let's see. Oh, it says, oh, sharing is paused. Can you see this? No, you can't see this? Oh, I'm sorry. I'll get rid of that then. What we see is the shim page. Gotcha, sorry about that. Now I gotta find it. I don't know how to bring that back. Doggone it. Let me see. Resume share. Gotcha. Okay. Um, what I consider important about Shim is again, I'm handing the baton of gallery practice right back to the artist and giving them a thumbs up on that. I actually do not think that artists will be punished for self-promotion and that they should feel very confident about self-promotion. And so we end up with a total of four uploads a year through Odetta Digital on the Shim Art Network. I do vet it a little bit, but I also consider Odetta Digital an entry point for artists to get onto Artsy and be affiliated with a network. And ideally, something like your group, the Artist Collective of Westport could become their own membership group on this network. And now you're in exchanging ideas. And when we get back to exhibitions in real life and art fairs, you will have those contacts. You would have those groups if you decided we're a collective out of Fairfield County or out of Connecticut, and we'd love to exchange exhibition space with a collective in, we'll say, Croatia. 
can we do that? Um, and, and so on. So what I love about this is that I again feel that I'm sharing opportunities with artists and I no longer have to control what you do. I'm happy to guide and I'm happy to give you feedback, but the control is down to the artist as it should be. And you end up in a digital record of your work that is traceable with a URL into perpetuity. And I consider the Shimart network a library. So when you're in a search on Artsy, you might want sculpture, monumental sculpture, and so on. So depending on the artist, their work will come up after they've gotten at least, I think the, the bottom line is 10 images. Once you're, you're at 10 images on Artsy, then you become searchable through their platform. So we do four uploads every quarter. So by the third quarter, you've got your 10 images. If you're already showing on Artsy with another gallery space, then you may already have your 10 images. Um, so questions about Odetta Digital, just follow us. We're about to launch. Uh, the next exhibition is called Page Turner. The current is called Essential Works. I was riffing on different, um, different pandemic language for a while there. This is a look of essential works. Camille Eskel is another that you guys I'm sure know her work. So when an artist submits their work to the template, it ends up on Artsy with a full description. And as you work down the page, you see our exhibition current but then you get to see the artist that you're searching out. And in the case of Camille, she has work shown on two different platforms, which she and I know is an error. She, you know, there's a learning curve involved on all of this, but We've talked about it. This exhibition that she was in is no longer current. So she will be moving this piece off as soon as the gallery allows, uh, gives her that time to move it. All of Camille's work that I'm showing is under Shim Art Network. How we, how we show the artwork and guide people to the um, artsy page, I do a lot of training with my new artist members. Uh, Suzanne knows this well. And um, we are doing a number of things to try and test markets because we wanna know how effective is Instagram as a selling platform. We know that artists are all using Instagram as any other advertising vehicle, social media, Instagram is the cat's meow right now. And uh, so we just closed last night, the Fair Share art auction. It was our second one. And this is strictly Instagram based, not artsy. Bring up Suzanne's piece. Here we go. Suzanne has valiantly followed my direction on uploading and artsy and the difference between a computer and a phone. I'm, I mean, she is a trophy winning artist, as you all know. This was her piece on the auction. And we do modest work by and large on this auction site to try and generate who is our collecting base. So the way this one works, we offer four charities that the final winner of the auction gets to select from one of our four charities. And this in the comments is where we had the bids move around. 
you can see I got the ball rolling for Suzanne. And then somebody that I don't know named Flatiron, Wendy Garber, she followed up. So she's in the New York Artist Circle. So it's a wonderful connection. And Suzanne will take half of the proceeds. The buyer donates the other half to the charity of their choice of our four and has to provide a receipt, a proof of donation in order for Suzanne to be willing to ship the work. And indeed, uh, the uh, final amount uh, also gets her in touch with a future collector. So fair share art auction, this one was mine up here. We all are learning how to talk, Instagram captions and so on. And I, I think we're coming into the end of the hour, right, Janine? Yes, we are, but um, I do want to open it up. Does anybody have any questions? I mean, I know I do. How do you go about finding your artists, Alan? Um, I put the key in the door and I open it. They come. There's yeah. no there's no end in sight to artists, right? Yeah. Especially because I'm an artist. Yeah. But but in any, you know, and I think the word on the street is that I'm nice. <laughs> <laughs> that helps. That means more come. And, um, you know, it, it, everybody asked me that question. How do you find your artists? I've never had to go looking. Never. Not once. Mm -hmm. I see a lot of art. I know a lot of art. I tell stories. If I need something that's going to fill the story and it's in my vision, I reach out to that artist. But we already pretty much know each other. Yeah, that's nice. Uh, I just want to say that Ellen is a dream to work with. She's enormously generous with her time, with her advice, um, with her help. Um, every, everything I've done with her has been, obviously, you can see how professional she is. Um, she's, I'm going to give you a sneak peek. She's a winner. She's a, win she's a brilliant winner. <laughs> I'm going to stop the screen share for a minute and show you what's going on for Suzanne. Oh, wow. This is Odetta Petit. That's a Jim Felice sculpture. I was also working with Jim and sizing things up. But Suzanne's images, do you see them? On the gallery walls? This is, this is a scaled model of my Odetta Bushwick space. Oh. And so now, now, Ellen, how will you show Odetta Petit? It's a, it's a digital space. Okay. And what I do, Suzanne is learning this now. Uh, if, if I've reached out to you about Odetta Petit, you're creating a scaled opportunity to scale your work up so that it can be monumental. Uh, just like how I did the summer solo shows in Bushwick, those large scale sculptures, I sold a lot uh, from those shows because people need monumentally scaled work at different times. So Suzanne and I are working on this idea that her JPEGs from her beautiful uh, Shinkole works were doing pioneer activists. And so her images of women uh, suffragist pioneers and equality, civil rights. We're selecting a few and I'll print those postcard size like you see here, but we will offer them also for sale as large uh, archival pigment prints at 60 by 40 inches. So um, the idea with Odetta Petite is that it will go on to my first dibs pages as monumentally scaled work, as well as work that's available in its original scale. Oh, very nice. Does anybody else have any questions? You were very thorough, Ellen. Yeah. <laughs> oh, and it's 1130 on the dot. <laughs> <laughs> 
Well, thank you. Thank you so much for spending time putting together a presentation and uh, you know being with us today. We really appreciate it. And uh, you know, good luck tomorrow on your is it radio? It's your Yale. It's Yale Radio with Brainerd Carey. Oh, do you know? Do you see his posts? So I'll I'll be posting it when it's all done. Uh, and, and I'd be happy to post this if you send me the recording. I think it went pretty smoothly, um, but I'll give it a listen and decide. Uh, you know, it, it's, it's really, um, uh, the one thing I wanna say about the digital, uh, the digital platforms that are out there, um, we have entered a new, a new phase in gallery practice. And the great thing about digital space, virtual space, is that it is limitless wherever your imagination wants to take it. It is mentally an exhibition space. Like I visualize these shows and, you know, just, just know that, that this is really important that you get good photographs of your work and take your ideas, even from a minor scale, a study, and propose it virtually. And Instagram is an amazing connector, as well as this artsy site, as well as any gallery that you can work with. There's so many opportunities digitally out there now for artists. So um, keep your portfolios current. So can I ask you a question um, about photographing your work? Because uh, right now I'm, you know, I'm a sculptor. I, I just take pictures with my cell phone. I do have a, a tripod, uh, but is that good enough? It depends on the venue. Um, if there's a lot of disturbance in the photograph that detracts from the sculpture, then it's not good enough. Yeah. Um, however, there's, there's different things that you can also create. I just closed Deborah Perlman, A Kind of Language. And I asked Deborah how her backstory, her work on Rapunzel back a sculpture in Chicago in 1979 influenced her work today. And she had never really written this stuff down so we created, and you'll see it um, on Odetta's pages, we created a series of minute and a half video interviews where she gave a narration about a source point and backed it up with a PowerPoint presentation of those early works. So they might've been reshot or scanned, but it gave the backstory and it gave animation to a space that no one was really able to go into. And I found that they were really well received. Mm -hmm. So for sculpture, your backstory or your, your process could be created and sped up through a video and then be sure and get really good photographs of the final piece. Mm -hmm. Don't, don't, you're not spending money on commuting. You're not probably spending a ton of money on studio rent anymore. So put it into good photography because this is the only way you're going to push forward. Can you recommend a good camera? No, I'm not a photographer. No, I hear that the iPhone 12 is pretty phenomenal when you're shooting yourself. And I will say this, I'm gonna put in a plug for my son. My son, Andrew, has been putting together three minute artist videos for you know different people. And that's one of his side jobs as a filmmaker and a composer. So if you're looking for a videographer where you're supplying all of the, the, the snippets from your studio, but you need somebody to synthesize it into three minutes and combine the sound, my son can give you a hand with that. And he's very, very reasonably priced because he's my son and knows art. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, photographs that have too much noise around them, 
I mean, why, why do that to yourself? This is your shot. Artsy is a multi-billion dollar platform. Give it your all, you know? That's great. Any, any other questions? All right, well, I'm gonna stop the um, recording.